Uh, no Man's Land really started following on from a project with Strike, and I had done this thing called Between Zero and One with Strike. And part of that show was bringing together my friends from around the world, inviting them to film themselves in any context and record themselves um, playing layers of a composition that I then assembled and it became part of this show. And it became a kind of mosaic video of these performances with Strike playing on the stage. And what was amazing for me was the impact that that part of the show had on the audience because it was the bit that everybody talked to me about afterwards. And the way they talked about it was how moved they were by seeing people from different parts of the world coming together in this in this kind of sacred space of the concert hall and playing with live musicians because the live musicians are the interface with the audience. So it's not just watching a film. <laughs> I just was really, I suppose, encouraged by that reaction because a lot of the time with contemporary music experience, you, you put something together, it gets played, and at worst there's a kind of mystified response and at best there is a kind of understanding or appreciation of it. But this was different. This was people being moved by something. And you know that's what I've been chasing personally is that kind of experience with sharing. So I thought afterwards, well, what can I do more like that? And it happened to happen at the time when um, the whole commemorative period sort of was being talked about for the First World War, which is not something I was particularly like interested in. And I have a pretty, you know, uh, love-hate relationship with that whole idea of commemorating conflict, especially if it's militarized commemoration. But it just happened to coincide with my thinking about this experience with the strike show. And I thought, well, what would be an application of that concept to something that is commemorative? And I thought, well, forgetting logistics, forgetting budget, forgetting all of that stuff, what would be amazing? And I thought what would be amazing would be to go back to the actual places with people that were descended from the populations that were fighting 100 years ago that happened to be musicians and bring those musicians back to those locations and get them to do something together. Because in, in my view, the way that music can be made at its best, that this, the most healthy context for music making, is one of the most healthy contexts we have as human beings. You know, it allows a certain kind of togetherness and sharing, you know, and, and positive expression, you know, in a communal way that not many other things do unless they are political in some way like you know like religious or sports or or politics itself you know there are other things but music is is free from most of that so that was the idea the idea was to go back to these places and it was a very vague loose kind of concept and that happened to coincide with me having a conversation after a function as we do here you know everybody's it's the same crowd at every event in Wellington and I happened to bump into the then Minister of the Arts, Chris Finlayson. And I just did my vague, enthusiastic sort of, oh, I've got this amazing idea, I reckon it's really cool. And he said, look, come and see me, because that does sound really interesting, and we're thinking about commemoration right now. So I went to see him, and he said, look, there's a fund. You should apply for it. And it happened to be like three weeks away, and this was a massive thing. So I decided to apply to the Lottery Grants Board World War One Commemorative Fund. And I spoke to two of my very good friends, Mike Wallace and Inga Rademeyer, who had made a film called Good For Nothing that I wrote the music for. And so we spent a very intense short period of time putting together a proposal to the Lottery Grants Board. And we applied for what felt uh, a cr like a crazy amount of money. And we applied, we got it over the line, and we just forgot about it. And then months later, when I was traveling in Greece, I got a, an email saying, congratulations, you got the money. And, you know, we were really blown away by it. And then our immediate response was the realisation that we had asked for way too little for what we wanted to do, even though it felt like a lot. 
And then the next thing was to build a team that was going to make the work. And uh, we brought on board a director. We have uh, had a director of photography. Uh, I was composer. Uh, and there were various other roles that we were going to work out as we went. Uh, so Jasmine Millett came on board as director and producer of the project. Matthew Knight was on board as director of photography. And Pamela Kane came on board as the line producer. And then there were other people also involved, but that was the kind of the core team. Uh, then began this incredible process of finding the musicians. And what was really interesting for me was that the music had not been written. And I was piecing together a kind of jigsaw puzzle of who would I like to play in this, who would I like to be a part of it, and what's the actual music going to sound like? And that was this very interesting process of pushing things forward on a, on a very broad front and getting to a point where I thought, well, okay, in part three, whatever that is, it would be really great to have a whole lot of percussionists. And so who would they be? And it was interesting for me because I did have a period of time where I could blue sky, you know, and just think in my, in my greatest fantasy, who would be involved in this thing? And I ended up asking, like, heroes of mine. There were people like Bijan Chemirani, who's an Iranian, French, Bandir, percussionist uh, player and I've admired his music making for years and transcribed things and used him in my teaching you know all that sort of thing and we got in touch with him and he um, he came on board you know it was a kind of amazing thing that he agreed to come on board and he's one of many and you know we often cite this thing that we had 150 musicians from 25 countries involved in this project I mean a big chunk of that 150 is an orchestra you know but there are a huge number of individuals as well so gradually the music was, was sort of created and the performers were selected and there was a whole other parallel energy going on in this project which was organising, getting all of these people in the right places at the right time. And the other person in the team that came on board, in fact one of the most important, was George Cariotis, the audio engineer. And George, it now transpires, had conceived of the entire audio journey of the project, which means planning what equipment was going to work on a hilltop underground in a makeshift recording studio in a basement somewhere. You know, all of the different scenarios that we could conceive of. And then also, how could that gear be used as part of the live show performance? And then how could he plan recording in all imaginable contexts inside and outdoors? and merging that with a live sound when we had the seven performers live on stage to create one sound, like one mix. And what I loved about the premiere that we did in Wellington was that Rachel Hyde, after that, did a review on Radio New Zealand on Upbeat, which for us was really like the ultimate review. It was one of the most... It came from such a place of understanding, that review. It's one to cherish forever. It makes up for all the other reviews that you get. And um, But the thing that Rachel pointed out, which was hugely important, was an awareness of what it meant to have such a an integrated final audio result. So that when you're hearing and watching this thing live, the bass player on the pillar screen stops playing at some point and you realise, oh, the bass player on stage is playing that same thing now. When did that happen? And that was basically the journey through the audio landscape of, of No Man's Land. And I think that George, I, I wonder if it will ever really be acknowledged, you know, what he achieved in this, because I don't think it's ever been done before in this way. Anyway, that was the team that was assembled, and this huge amount of planning started. The musicians were selected, and some of them we had to just keep trying until we were actually in Europe filming. So, for instance, we, we had the most incredible outcome with the rappers that were in, at the end of one of the parts, uh, the refugees of rap, who, who were Syrian refugees living in France at the time that we connected with them. And in fact, they're, they're second stage refugees and that their, their grandparents were refugees from Palestine to Syria. You know, so it's sequential refugeeism, if you like. Um, and that was figured out two days before we filmed them. You know, we And we did this incredible kind of bringing them there. So that journey of bringing it all together didn't stop until we had finished the shoot. It just went all the way through that. Um, logistically, the team 
basically in Auckland they were based, which was Jasmine and Pamela and Eric Millett as well, and others were um, working around the clock with you know trains, planes, rental cars, all of that kind of transportation and accommodation and timings of schedules. In some ways, that's one of the great achievements of the project is that that happened, you know, that it was actually um, successful in bringing everybody together. We had no misses. Everybody was there in the end. I arrived at the point where I thought, okay, this is it now. I have to write the score to this project. And it's kind of important to note that this was back to front in terms of a normal film project where you get given a film and then you write music to it. I, the timing of it was I was going to write the score and then we were going to make the film. So it was the other way around. And so I knew that there was no way of just saying, okay, this is bar one, and then 80 minutes later I'll be at the end of the piece when I've written all of this music. But it couldn't work like that for me. So I knew that what I had to do was a kind of global overview of the work in terms of emotional trajectory. I had to figure that out first. We'd already arrived at a, an understanding that there would be six parts and they each had a kind of theme or topic or a concept. You know, the first part was leaving home and traveling to destination. The second part was specifically to do with women in that time and women now. The third part was really about conflict and war and the, the locations, like the places of conflict. And the fourth part was about spirituality and death and concepts of what happens after death as well. Um, the fifth part was a kind of celebration of the fact that in the worst moments, empathy and humanity survive. Like we, we do have that desire to maintain and, and have our humanity survive in these moments. And then the sixth part was a look to the future. You know, like what is next, the next hundred years. So we had that structure. And then I needed to emotionally contextualize these things because every one of those six things could have been emotionalized any number of ways. And one of the things that we were agreed on was trying as much as possible not to obviously steer the audience into an emotional space, but to allow for multiple experiences through this work. Anyway, it was such a big thing to start in terms of a composition, having all of this in the head and thinking, okay, I've got to write this music now. And knowing that, for instance, big chunks of it would be structured improvisation from amazing musicians from Turkey or India and so on. So how do you go about doing it? And so the emotional trajectory was the way in. And I figured emotional contexts for each of the six parts. And then I thought, I'm not going to deal with rhythm. I'm not going to deal with melody. I'm just going to deal with harmony. Because harmony is going to be the bedrock of the emotional journey. And I've been doing you know, some work in film and teaching film scoring as well. And one of the things we talk about a lot in that context is emotional specificity. Like, you know, you want specifically an emotional experience. So what is the chord that's going to achieve that? And you play that chord and you go, actually, if I change one note, the emotional nuance or the, you know, the, the shading of the emotional experience changes significantly. So getting that right was really important. And I was very lucky, uh, a friend of ours, Leslie Shannon, who has a house in White, and I said, why don't you go and stay in that house? There's no one there. You can look at the beach and you can sort of think it through. And I spent two weeks just looking at the sea and at Kapiti Island with my keyboard, um, just working out harmonic progressions and chords and thinking, is that the feeling? Is that the feeling? You know, is that, is that where we want to be in the space, you know, the context? And that was kind of an amazing experience, actually, to get rid of all of the detail, to have, not have to worry about that. And to just think, what is the backdrop, you know, the, the emotional, psychological context in which all of this detail is going to happen. And I guess it's like somebody who's painting a massive canvas, starting with all of the backdrop and all of the background, and knowing that they're going to put people into those places afterwards. So uh, it was a very kind of liberating and amazing experience. I, I don't know that there are many situations writing music where that is useful, I mean, where it can work like that. But it was to do with having a long time, like it's a big piece, and knowing that I had to slot in also musicians that were going to bring their own thing to it and wouldn't be entirely constrained by notes on paper. So by the time I finished that, I had this map of harmony, which interestingly, the more I worked at it, got simpler and simpler and 
sound simpler because I realized that in order to convey something in a certain way it needed to have the least amount of distraction in the harmonic progressions so you know primarily triads and just primary chords a lot of the time very simple and I have to say that um, that was a huge leap of faith on my part to simplify materials to that degree and have the confidence that by the time we got to the end of the creative process the music would have the impact and the power you know there are things like in, in part three which has all of the percussionists and it's got Ryan Preble playing guitar it's a very simple idea over and over and over again um, yeah for me that's a kind of act of musical courage to do something like that because the tendency is oh not interesting enough add something not interesting enough add something else and then eventually it gets interesting enough anyway so that was how the harmonic framework was created and then it was a case of filling in and creating things like what is the tempo how fast is this thing this particular part what do i think of the the tempo um, what are the sounds like what are the textual layers that are going to go into this to communicate things who's going to sing who's going to play and what space do i need to allow for them got to that point and the next step was to work with the musicians themselves from a distance preparing for when we were finally together with microphones and cameras and that was also I guess a unique opportunity for me because I covered the entire continuum of working with uh, notation based practice which is orchestras and choirs that need a score will read it and perform it to people like Deria Turkan who's the Kaminsha player in um, Istanbul who doesn't really want to talk about it too much or know too much about it because he turns up in a kind of pure state and just needs to know the the key and just a few a few things about what's happening so that he can he can do something that is a one-time only unique experience which we capture and when we did his record session we did it once we just used that first thing you know but then there were others like Mita Pandit from India who was incredible to work with and we had quite a few Skype sessions where she would sing to me over the backing and I, we would talk about it and eventually it evolved into something but wasn't finished so that by the time we got together she did something that was fresh but really appropriate and powerful in the context. <laughs> And I think it was like a really amazing growing experience to work in that entire continuum from the fully notated to the we'll just talk about it a bit and in the middle there's all of this like with the percussionists you give them guides to what kind of groove you you want and lengths of things but you know that they're going to turn up and once they hear everything else they will modify and adjust and suggest and do their thing and so it's leaving that open so that they can do those sorts of things and for it to work in the overall context and not uh, not break the thing that we're trying to make so very interesting and growing process jasmine had this fantastic concept right which was um, when we get musicians to these locations they're all going to have some kind of experience internally when they arrive in these places and her idea was to film them having their first experience in these locations and there's an incredible bit I mean there's lots but there's an incredible bit with the nudge the Wellington based group with Uriah, James and Ryan walking through some trenches and the cameras on them as they're walking through and that face that they have is absolutely genuine and it's their experience of the dawning of understanding of what this really is and I think that that's actually one of the most powerful elements within the film is capturing that um, experience and of course then it affects what they do with their instruments when they play it's a very powerful way of authenticating the performances that we were getting from the musicians
Well, the, th the thing about the musicians coming together, because we, we managed to assemble small groups of musicians within the project, is that it's a kind of expression of the metaphor of the work, which is that, um, you know, it's such a cliche, every time you say it, it's a cliche, but it's so true, which is that you bring musicians together and as soon as they start making music together, they, they transcend ethnicity, gender, age, religion, politics, and they become human beings having a great time doing something really great, you know, really cool. And that was the most obvious for us when we brought together um, percussionists. Because percussionists, they find a kind of visceral, physical point of connection in what they do. And we had a couple of really incredible experiences where we brought together Shabazz Hussein, um, Bijan Chemirani, and uh, Farah Diouf. So Farah's from Senegal, Bijan's from France and Iran, and Shabazz from Pakistan, plays tablets. And they turned up the night before we were going to film and record. We were in a, a, at a, on a farm, we went into the barn, and they set up and we did a kind of um, practice run. And they didn't know each other at all, and they didn't know us. And within like five minutes, once their instruments were out, they were just jamming and doing that thing that they do. And it was a great example of what music does, what it's capable of doing. You know, I really believe this. I really believe that music is unique in the way that it allows that to happen. And we had time and time again this experience with bringing people together. So that was... Oh, and the other thing is that they themselves said that this is one of the best projects they've been involved in, many of them because of that experience. And there were other examples, like more serious ones, like um, Hayden Chisholm, who's a fantastic New Zealand saxophone player living in Germany, in a great musical spirit, coming together with uh, Deria Turkan from Istanbul and Sadreddin Oshimi, the Ney player from Istanbul. And we brought them together into the same space. And it really became like a mystical experience. This is for part six of No Man's Land. And just th what happened during the 14 or 15 minutes that we recorded them was this very powerful, profound, I don't know what to call it, you know, it was kind of an epiphany kind of experience. And they all felt it, we felt it, and we captured it, that's the thing. You know, one of the great things about the funding for this project was I managed to, um, well, I was, I was basically given by the university um, three master's scholarships that I could offer to students to come on board with the project. And I managed to get three amazing guys, uh, Jack Hooker, Kenyon Shanky, and Stephen Payton. And they were all enrolled in master's degrees, and part of their master's experience was to be a part of this project. And I do think that they probably had the best master's experience anyone's ever going to have, you know, as a student in music in New Zealand. Um, and they, but they worked really hard. And the thing is, though, that they got to come with us to Europe for the three months that we were shooting. And they were completely a part of the entire process. And Jack also got to come to India, where we filmed and recorded Mita. So, you know, very special. But the important thing about that experience for me is that they are now, in my opinion, like 30 years ahead of me. And that they had the experience I had at 50 when they were 20. You know, that kind of thing. So very, very special. And I think probably a huge part of their life in terms of what they do from this point on. The level of confidence, the experiences they had, the people they met, the philosophies they came into contact with, and these many musicians, very powerful. And also seeing very close up what it was for me to go through putting this together, and that it's not this kind of thing you see from the outside, which is the result, but that there's this process that you go through to get to that result. And by and large, most of that process is difficult. It's not easy, you know, and it involves a huge amount of um, uh, being exposed and vulnerable, you know, and fragility and anxiety, all of that stuff, which is part of it, vastly amplified because of the scale of the project. And then seeing also mechanisms for coping, you know, and surviving and trying to stay as positive as possible throughout that whole journey. So that by the time you get to the end of it, you can look back and go, it was worth it. Because that's the most important thing. It's got to have been worth it by the time you get to the end. 
So I think that that was also part of their journey as well, was witnessing, you know, how these things actually happen in the real world. And things like, you know, one of the great stresses of the project was financial and getting to the end and always needing more, always needing more and having to front up. Like if you're the face of the project, which I was for a lot of it, um, you're the one that has to knock on the door and say, look, we really need something, can you help? Um, and for them to see that, and that that's, a, that's actually a part of making things happen, is being able to do that kind of thing, which I hate. I hate doing that stuff. I, it's so not natural to me. Uh, and actually having to do it, you know, all this, all this time. Yeah, and just seeing that there, there are all those dimensions to a project like this, and seeing that, watching me go through this, trying everything possible to preserve the kind of creative sanctity of the journey, that it's not compromised as you go through, because if that gets compromised, then in some ways everything is diminished. So that's that I think has been really great for them. And um, it was just such a special thing to to travel with them. And I would love to do more of that. I'd love to find ways of bringing students into projects, you know, in quite a quite an intensive way. And then they also did their own projects as part of their masters, which were feeding off what we were doing. So Jack Hooker, for instance, part of what he did for his masters involved working with musicians from overseas and dialing them in, you know, like getting them to go into a studio to record and then integrating that into recordings over here in New Zealand, you know, building on on the sorts of things that were being learnt as part of the project. We need somehow to generate scholarships for postgraduate composition students so that they can have these amazing experiences. It is interesting being described as the composer of mega projects, right? Because in the end, it is just a piece of music that you're writing. That is the core activity. Everything else, it's, it's a sphere in the centre of all of these bigger spheres. But the crucial thing is what's in the centre, which is the writing of the music. And for instance, when I did the work for the Olympics, um, yeah, it was this huge thing, and the audience was going to be a staggering size, all of that stuff. But in the end, I was sitting at the piano with some manuscript, and I had my music software there, and I was thinking, well, what, what, what's the chord progression? What's the melody? You know, what's the rhythm? I mean, that's really what you deal with. That's the core thing. And as long as that remains the, the most important part of the process... Everything else is kind of logistics and organisation and, um, you know, uh, functioning when you're tired and overcoming stress or dealing with stress and those sorts of things. But the, the creative component has to be secure. That's the really important thing. I think it sort of starts to unravel when creatively you feel like it's not where it should be for you. I mean, you've, you've, had, to, you've had to pull back or you've had to compromise what you really wanted to say creatively. And the thing about mega projects, of course, is that you don't do them alone. There's so many other people that are a part of this. You know, I was the composer for this project, which was a more complex role than normal in terms of composition because there was a huge amount of artist liaison and interaction dealing with a whole lot of people. I was also one of the producers of the project and I ended up being the hub in the middle of all of the spokes that were going out. That's kind of where it, where it evolved to. Uh, so wearing many hats, but the core job was the person that wrote this music. Yeah, I, I, I don't advocate taking on big projects lightly, you know, because they firstly take a lot of time. I'm three years into this project and there's still a couple to go. So it's a big project. But it's also sort of unprecedented in my own journey. It's a new thing. And I guess to just create a slightly broader context, for me the whole idea throughout all of my life creating music has been how do I keep learning, how do I keep growing? That's the thing, how do I keep growing? And growing doesn't necessarily mean bigger, but just growing as a kind of artistic person. Uh, and the only way I know... And I'll be so upset if I find out there were other ways. But the only way that I know is to make things hard on yourself. Is to push yourself into a corner creatively and to have to find a way out. And sometimes you have to put on you know, the kind of creative boxing gloves and fight your way out. 
Other times it means putting on a ninja suit and sneaking out in some sort of sneaky way. But, you know, to think that the only way I'm going to get to the end of this is by learning new things and by growing. And that's one thing that big projects do, is they force you to grow in certain areas, you know, develop certain skills and certain abilities. Other projects, like, you know, if I had to write a, now a, a 10 minute solo flute piece, I've never done that. And I would have to learn a whole bunch of things in order to be able to do that well. Um, after we filmed and recorded in Europe in late 2015, we went to India and did a quick shoot and record there. Then we came back and the edit of the film happened and basically we were ready to go. So at the beginning of 2016, we started the process of bringing together the resources for the live shows. And we had the world premiere in Wellington, we had a show at the Auckland Festival, and then we performed in Tauranga, Napier, and Wanganui, and we ended with a big outdoor performance at WOMAD. And so that was the basic run of the live show premiere season, if you like. And that was an incredible project of its own, and we brought together seven musicians, three from Greece, one from Poland, and three from New Zealand. And we brought George, the audio engineer, out from Greece to mix the live shows. And uh, it was incredible because we had made these eight pillar screens, seven pillar screens, and projected individual musicians and graphics onto those. Um, Lakshman Ananda Nayagam from Auckland um, had put together the graphics for from a, country, uh, a company called Creature. Uh, and we had the big screen on the top and the live musicians kind of there as well on stage. What was amazing about the live band was that, you know, we had three people from Greece, one from Poland and three from New Zealand. And touring with these people was amazing because you had the super laid back New Zealand kind of version. And then you had the very kind of busy, energized European, modern European version and um, it was such a great experience traveling with these people and the bonding that happened in that group was really great to be around i felt really happy to have been a part of that and um, i think that you know if we manage to get the show overseas which is what we're trying to do now it's inconceivable that we would remove or change any members of that group because they really became a kind of family and what was amazing was going through the actual performances, that sequence of shows, was that it kind of got deeper and deeper for them on stage. And they got to the point where after the performance, sometimes they would be in some completely other space. And a few times they would say, we really felt like there were other presences in the hall. You know, they felt they were feeling other worldly kind of things going on. And I just thought that that was an incredible thing to go on. And the fact that they consider this to be a very special project and are open always to being a part of it again is another kind of validation. So really amazing. And of course, incredible musicians. Really great to just be in contact with musicians like that. And we went through this process of live shows and what really amazed me and in some ways, you know, was a big corner for me was people coming up to me after the shows and saying, I can't talk to you right now, I don't want to talk to you right now. I want to take this away. I want to have it in me. I just want to be with it. And then I'll write to you. And they would write the most incredible things afterwards about the journey, the experience. And I thought, well, that's very special in the sense that since I started writing music from like 11 or 12 years old, that's what I wanted to do, was to create music that gave people that experience. And I felt, well, okay, finally I've done it. You know, 40 years on, I've finally done it. And to be honest with you, I think that if I was to stop writing music now, or be unable to, I would feel okay, because I've finally done that thing that I set out to do. And just on that note, I had a very interesting experience while traveling on the tour because we got a couple of less than favorable reviews. I mean, it's always going to happen. You're not going to, you know, never is anybody, is everybody going to love something. Um, but the thing is, because, you know, very vulnerable at that time, it sort of bothered me, you know. And um, George, the engineer, who I'm very close to, he said to me at one point, he said, well, what's wrong? I mean, this is an amazing journey we're on. You know, what's the matter? And I said, oh, I got these, I saw these reviews, and, you know, it was not too good. And, 
And he just said, look, man, just think about what's happened. We've created something that moves ordinary people. Not music specialists, but just people. He said, that's the holy grail. I mean, that's the kind of thing we're after. You know, it's a very special thing to have done that. And that recontextualized the whole experience for me. And I'm always going to be grateful to George for, you know, just repositioning how I felt about what was going on. Um, and so, anyway, I have this amazing and beautiful collection now of messages and emails and so on that I got from many people that were at those shows um, saying the most incredible things, things that we set out to try and achieve. And it's a, you know, it's a testament to the whole team that we managed to get to the end of the process and create this outcome. One of the things about the project is the degree of support that it's received. I mean, we got this incredible grant from Lotteries, but we've also received an incredible amount of support from Victoria University, because this is my, my home really, you know, being a professor here. And they have given a huge amount of resource to the project. Interestingly, on that note, I think universities are kind of unique in being able to offer a kind of infrastructure and resource to projects that are as complex as this that don't necessarily have to make a profit. You know, whereas a film, a commercial film, there has to be some budget balance at the end of it. That's the whole idea. Not the whole idea, but it's, it's the whole idea of the budget anyway. Um, so lottery grants in Victoria University really underpinned the whole project. But then we received incredible support from like the Polish Embassy, the British High Commission, French Embassy, um, MFAT, you know, our, our embassies in other countries when we were traveling, you know, engaging with them. Uh, it's, a, it's a huge list of, and of support and private donations, I mean, amazing ones in, in particular, there's one in the UK, Adrian Durham, just huge, huge help for the project. Um, and then with Park Road Post Productions, you know, I have uh, an ongoing relationship with them over having done film projects and they're very generous in helping us with the courses that we deliver in film scoring. And I was in communication with them about this project and then at one point in one of those meetings, uh, Vicky Jackways, the, the, one of the people that I know, um, she just said, look, we can't not be a part of this. We, we think it's such an important project. We really, we really want to help it. We really want to contribute. And so they essentially sponsored the project in a very special way. Because the thing about Park Road is it's not, it's not just that it's a kind of financial contribution to the project by doing that. It's the energy and the ethos of the place itself, which as you go there and everybody's just so kind of positively disposed towards what you're doing that you just feel great about the work. And everybody wants the absolute best outcome and will challenge always, like, oh, I don't think it's quite good enough, and push it up a bit and push it up. And so you yourself realize that there's more potential throughout the journey of working there. So that was a, an amazing gift and got to work on the color grade there and on the mix, those two things, really fantastic. So yeah, just so there's so much gratitude and so much giving and love because the the contribution of Park Road Post was was not a financial gain one. You know, it was an actual emotional investment in what we're doing from human beings that are there, like people uh, are feeling a certain way. So you just feel very, very lucky to have so much goodwill towards the project. And what we're doing now is we're starting the process of trying to get the show overseas in 2017-2018. And we have submitted the film itself, because there's a standalone version of the film, uh, to film festivals in various parts of the world, and we're waiting to hear back about that. So I guess for me, the, the position that I feel like I'm in is I'm the custodian of the project right now. And I, I hold the, the energy and the contribution of very many people and there's a huge amount of love in this project and giving and what I want to do is put all the energy that I can into making the most of it while we're still in this commemorative period which is really the next couple of years and seeing what is possible in that time because I, I think it's really worth it.